How's it going, First Southern Baptist Church? Pastor Ryan here doing what I think is going to be the last video um, in this series on the Constitution Bylaws. It's been a few weeks, and that's because we're kind of working on touching up a few things for hopefully, Lord willing, what will be um, the final draft um, of this document, at least for now. You know, these things always get tweaked and, and changed a little in the future as things go on. But by God's grace, I think we've been able to put together a really helpful um, and Lord willing, biblically faithful document that will be of great service to our church ordering itself in a way that's God honoring. And just as the start of this video, um, I just want to say a, a big thank you to everyone who's been engaged in this process as we put forward um, the first proposed um, draft back in January. Um, the whole membership has really been on board and with us through this process. So I, you know, I preached a five-week sermon series on church particulars and, and got some good feedback on that and engagement from the congregation. We've been going through in our Sunday school class um, the proposed statement of faith, which is 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. And that's been well attended and you guys have been engaging with that. And even some that couldn't attend have been watching um, or listening to the lectures um, online afterwards. Very appreciative to all of you who have been plugging into that. And that's not necessarily easy, especially if you're not familiar with confessionalism or these older documents and you guys have been really tracking really following along with that that's been a real encouragement to my soul and then as well i just want to thank you to all those who have been watching these videos and some of them have been longer than others and you guys have been plodding through trying to be faithful to really study um th this and i'm just grateful for each of you and i want to i want to give a particular thank you um to the elders who've been so gracious and going through far more revisions of this document than you guys have even seen. Um, we've had so many conversations on this, and I'm just grateful for um, Pastor Dwight and Pastor Tom and their faithfulness in this process. And additionally, I just want to say, should do a shout out and thank you to, to both Dean and Brenda Larson, who a lot of what I'm about to go over in this video um, was recommendations they made. A number of them were things that I just wanted to tweak um, in the final document. But a huge thank you to you guys and your faithful contribution. Um, to really go through this line by line and try to help make it the best document you could. So I'm very grateful to all of you. I want to say on the front end of this video that our plan is going to be to vote on this document at our members meeting in June, um, as laid out in this video. If you have reservations to that, reach out to, to myself or one of the other elders. Um, we would rather push this off and wait till the, the congregation is ready um, to vote on it. So we're not trying to rush this or force this or cram this through. So if going through this, you're still a, have reservations. You're unsure. You're not ready. Um, you have concerns. Please make those aware to us. But the reason why we're putting this up to vote in June, Lord willing, and the kind of as our plan is because we have not received pushback. We have not received concerns from the congregation. I have not received really anyone saying they're not ready to vote on it or they have major reservations for it. Um, so because of that, we're going to continue to move forward, but I'm just putting this out there. No, we're going to put it out there to vote on it in June. But what we really don't want to happen is come the meeting in June, all of a sudden now people are raising objections that we have not heard yet. We have not been aware of. We want to know those beforehand if you have them. But because we haven't heard any objections, we're not going to continue to move forward with trepidation, assuming there's reservations when there's not. So that's the plan. Let us know if you're unsure. Uh, but with that being said, in this final video, I'm just going to go through some of the, the proposed changes um, to the document that was put forward in January. I think most of these are just going to be really good and helpful edits. I don't think there's substantial change in here, um, except for a few more procedural points um, than any sort of real doctrinal or philosophical changes in this document. So let me go through some of the changes are going to be like a comma here or there or a wording change here and there. I'm not going to cover all of those. Um, you can compare documents. I'm going to distribute this um, new proposed um, with edits document via email and hard copy um, to the body. Um, but I'm, I'm just not going to go through every sort of comma change. That's not helpful for this video. But rather substantive wording or, or article changes is what I'll go through. So going through the first page, there's no major change in this document. Um, minor punctuation um, sort of changes, um, nothing or small wording changes. 
going into the section on the church particulars. This is why I preached a five um, sermon series on. The first three, there was no real significant changes, minor wording changes. Um, the removal of one proof text that I later came to realize was a bad proof text. Nothing really significant in those. On the fourth point of intentional hospitality and community, this last part of it was reworded, but the substance of it did not change. Um, it was just a little bit clunky in its original wording. Um, so we tried to clean that up a little bit. So you see that whole section highlight of a change. It's all the same content, just reworded a little bit differently. And going into the fifth one, um, I did bolster, I think, this fifth one in that I thought of the five particulars, this section was worded the most poorly. And I think the reason behind that was when I originally wrote it, I really felt like it was the most aspirational of the five um, in that some of these things we weren't really doing. And so a lot of the language I used initially is like aspire to, try to, um, we're, we want to, and I just think it's more helpful to use more definitive language. And also I wanted to have it be stronger in its biblical language pertaining to the mission of God. So not just us wanting to be on mission, but really emphasizing that God is on mission. He has a plan and we want to join ourselves to his mission, his plan. So let me reread how I rewrote um, this and you'll see the highlighting portions are what changed. Um, so a lot of it still is the same, but it says, finally, as a church, we are committed to proclaiming the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that tagged on there for the glory of God alone. And then I added, we will do so standing upon the promises of God's word and believing that the Lord is making all his enemies his footstool. If you've been around um, recently, you've heard me quote that text a number of times. It's Psalm 110.1, the most quoted verse in the Old Testament in the New Testament pertaining to the mission of God and what he's doing here in the world. So I wanted to add that biblical strength of it that we are joining ourselves based on the promises of God's word and what God is doing in the world. Going on, it says, and this was in the last one as well, as a church, we will regularly encourage, equip, and expect our members to share the gospel with others. As a first importance, this section was in the last one. Again, I just reworded it slightly. We will emphasize the discipleship of our own homes and the necessity of raising our children in the Lord. Further, we will seek to be a faithful gospel witness in so this language. Again, I just tried to strengthen it a little bit. This section was already in there. Further, we will seek to be a faithful gospel witness in Junction City, Fort Riley, and the surrounding area. Extending from there, we will join ourselves to the mission of God. Again, just try to strengthen that mission and point to the mission that God is on and us joining it um, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And then I hear quoted from Habakkuk 2.14, which is, um, I, I paraphrased it, but it says, until the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is why we're on mission is because God is on mission and we can stand upon his promises as quoted earlier in that mission that he is doing this and we want to join ourselves to what God is doing. And then conclude it. We will do so through prayer, financial giving, and church planting as the Lord directs. I summarize some of the more great commission verbiage into just church planting, which is what the ultimate fruit of that is as God doing mission work across the globe, globe is seeking to have faithful churches planted across the globe. Um, so just reworded um, that a little bit and then put as the Lord directs, because we're not necessarily going to do church planting in the next five minutes, but as the Lord directs, we want to be involved in that work regionally, um, nationally, and internationally. All right. So I tried to strengthen this one with some more biblical resolve and language. The substance of it, though, does not change um, anything from the sermon I preached on that topic that you guys heard. So continuing uh, forward, um, there's a couple of minor wording changes as we get into a section on membership. Um, the one here, I think, was a helpful change. This one was recommended by uh, Dean and Brenda, where it, before it says fulfillment of the Great Commission requires church membership, where rather the fulfillment of the Great Commission implies church membership. I think that's a good wording change. Again, not really changing the substance of it. Um, I had a typo here, <laughs> fix that typo. Um, another one um, recommended um, by by Dean Brenda that was a helpful um, addition, I think, in the duties of church membership. It 
previously said, to be faithful in all duties essential to Christian life. Well, are any of us perfectly faithful in all duties essential to Christian life? No, we're not. And, and that wasn't our intent in laying this out, but that's a helpful thing to point out. And so rather just including to strive to be faithful, which I think is better wording of it. So that's a, a minor change. Again, same sort of substance in what we're going for here, just the rephrasing of the sentence to make it a little more clear what was being said um, regarding the process of candidacy and reception. Um, one, one thing we did change here um, in, in this section, um, and this is getting into the elder interview for members we're receiving. Um, we changed the wording from, let me pull up the original wording here, from before what says is, this is after hearing the testimony of the prospective member it says this is ne necessary because we believe the church membership is for before it said true believers only. Um, and we changed that to we believe that membership is for sincere professing believers only simply to say that there might be people that um, are members of the local church that aren't actually true believers. They might not actually be regenerate. They might be deceived or deceiving us. That that's something that does happen. But in as much as we are able to discern um, from a local body that they are sincere professing believers, I think that's something that we can actually credibly say and vet, um, trusting that the Lord has the true knowledge of who is genuinely regenerate and not. And so I think it's just a, a more honest statement of church membership um, as opposed to um, the other one. I think it it's presumptive in what we can actually discern um as as mere men so i think that's a better phrasing of what was intended there this this point on um to make sure the proposed member understands what is expected of members in the church the third point um there is a question on what was meant exactly by his religion as it pertains to this point so it's we we didn't change the wording of it it says a godly separated life which will promote the honor of jesus christ his religion and his church um, thought about changing the wording there of religion, um, but that is a biblical category, and it's particularly the separated life and religion um, are both coming from a biblical passage that was in mind. So rather than changing the, the wording of this, um, I opted to just include this scriptural reference to give context to what is meant by that point. All right. So um, didn't change the wording, but wanted to give clear biblical grounding of what is meant by that wording with a, a solid uh, proof text, which is added there. Going forward, we changed um, during this part um, on dear, as members are brought forward to the congregation in the members meeting, and they are to share a testimony. The language in the previous um, edition of this proposed constitution bylaws had this sentence where it said, if the prospective member is excessively shy or unable to attend a me the meeting, they may submit their testimony in writing to be distributed to members for review. Um, we we don't like the language there of excessively shy. The more it sat with us, um, that that just is unhelpful um, because there's a whole number of reasons why a written um, testimony might be read at the meeting. Not only for someone shy, maybe they're deployed, maybe they're traveling, maybe they're is a language barrier. There's all kinds of other reasons. So we just changed the language to make it more broad and to give more discretion um, for how that could play out. So as the prospective member's testimony will then be shared with the members who are present at the meeting. This will either be shared by the prospective member themselves or in some circumstances, a reading of their testimony may be shared. All right, so just made it a little more general and allowed for a little bit more discretion um, on that point. Um, here there's just, uh, it wasn't clear in talking about church discipline, who was actually being related to in this sentence. Um, so the addition of said member, as opposed to members, um, it was just to clarify that point, no real substantive change there. So I'm going to keep moving on pertaining to situations of disciplining a member. Um, we, we changed the wording here to include that that would be done by secret ballot. Um, I think that was what our intent originally, but it wasn't clearly stated. It's good to have stated formal processes in these things um, because especially how emotionally charged um, something like church discipline can be. We want the process to be 
very clear. And in following on that, we wanted to make it clear that where this would be done or in what atmosphere this would be done. So we clearly stated that this would typically be done at a quarterly members meeting. But then at the end, caveated that by saying, in those urgent cases, the church may utilize a specially called members meeting to address the issue in a timely manner pertaining to something that would be an extraordinary circumstance where it would need to be addressed more quickly, giving a, a, a clear designated spot in our process um, for the ability to address in that manner if the circumstance necessitates. Um, again, minor wording or sentence just changes um, from plural to singular, adding, removing of commas, that sort of thing, nothing general. Regain to church officers, this was just a rewording to make it slightly clear, but the exact same substance being taught, so I won't go over that. Um, this, as it requains, pertains to the general prerequisites of church officers. Um, the third point here is dealing with the fact that the, these offices are limited to women. And in the original wording, and I, I will just own this, um, it just came across as a little condescending to women. And I, I'll just say that that was not my heart. I was not trying to do that, but it kind of read that way. And as that was pointed out to me, I, I think they were right. And the way it was worded was just not helpful. And the original wording, what said is um, the first part of this being the same. While we acknowledge the valuable gifts which God has given to women, and then hear the changed portion, listen to how it read before, and the wonderful assistance they may render to the officers of the church. Well, a, a wonderful, that, that was kind of like, that word comes across as condescending. And then it implied that the only assistance they were in the church was to helping the church officers, which they do so much more than that. And the proof texts that are given here showed that they do so much more than that in the body of the local church than just assisting the church officers. The reason that was in there is because the section's particular to church officers, but it just wasn't the most helpful wording. So we, we adjusted that to say they're vital contributions to the ministry of the church. I think that just reads better um, and it more clearly communicates what we were attempting to communicate there. So um, for what it's worth, we tried to make that worded better and I appreciate the feedback on that. It wasn't my intent, but certainly I want to correct that um, in the document. Going on um, into the section on elders and deacons, we did not change anything on the substance of those sections, but we did change um, on the process of appointment. So we're scrolling way down here. Um, procedure of appointment. The, the main change we did here is um, tried to clarify when a uh, a search committee would or wouldn't be used, particularly if you're hiring like a staff or a vocational is typically how it'd be phrased in the document, a vocational elder, or another way to say that would be staff pastor, um, the, the same thing. Um, when would we use a search committee and when would we not? The previous paragraph here um, was just kind of a mess. It didn't make sense. It wasn't clear and that was pointed out to me and it's, it's true, it wasn't worded well. Um, so I think this paragraph better communicates um, when we would use a search committee, when we wouldn't, um, and, and why. So it says the church should always look within its membership to see if Christ is equipping officers from within the church. The training and recognizing of men internally is the ide ideal method for installing elders and deacons. All right. So that statement on the front end, I think helps clarify some of that language was in the previous one, but putting that on the front end, I think helps. We want to raise elders and deacons from within our membership, ideally and normatively. That's how the majority of our officers should come into the church, um, and that should be stated. But it says, yet, we recognize that there are situations where the church may need to seek officers from outside the membership, particularly for vocational elders, when no suitable candidate exists within the membership. In these instances, either the elders or a designated search committee may be utilized to seek candidates for that position. And note that. And then it goes on to say these external candidates would need to meet all the same qualifications and go through the same examination, election, and ordination process as would any other officers. I want to note here what how it's phrased. It says... We recognize our situation where church may need to seek officers from outside of membership, particularly for vocational elders, 
when no suitable candidate exists within the membership. And this is a sentence I want to highlight. In these e instances, either the elders or a designated search committee may be utilized. So in the circumstance where there's multiple elders, like we have now, for example, we have three different elders. Say we wanted to hire another vocational elder or staff pastor as like an associate pastor of the church or a co-pastor or what, whatever, say our church grew and we wanted to hire another pastor. Um, we could handle within our eldership right now that search process. Now we'd still have to bring any proposed candidate before the membership to go through the same examination, election, or nation process as would any other officer. The membership would certainly be involved in all of that. But as elders right now, we could handle putting out um, the job application out there. We could handle the receiving of resumes. That's something we could do right now in a healthy way with no problem. Well, just uh, not that long ago when I was hired, um, Pastor Dwight was the only um, elder at the church. He was working full time. It wasn't realistic to place that all upon his shoulders. All the while, he's trying to do all the pastoring of the church. He's preaching every Sunday on top of working um, full time to have him run the entire search process for what ended up being my position and my hire. That wouldn't have been fair or reasonable to put all on his shoulders. So there's circumstances like that where assembling a search committee is totally justified. And so we wanted to put it in here that give giving some discretion to the situation, either the elders or search committee could be utilized and making clear that it's not ideal to have to hire officers from outside the church, but in some circumstances that is what's necessary. All right, going forward, I hope that's clear enough. Feel free to ask questions if it's not. If for the election, we just wanted to make sure there was something in here stating that if members have concerns about a potential officer, they should make those known beforehand. We shouldn't wait to just bring up things at members' meetings um, and cause contention where that could have been avoided. All right, so that's all that's stated there. Um, removal of officers, no significant changes in this first part. But coming down to the final section on removal of officers, I mentioned this in the previous video, but the previous section um, on this, you know, the first three really have to do with elders either stepping down or being elders or deacons stepping down or being removed for cases of sin. But we, we didn't really have a process for how do members go about um, seeking the re-examination of an elder or deacon, not to something necessarily due to sin, but just due to the fact that they may no longer be qualified or competent for the office. Um, there was no real system for that. And so what we had put in there in the last um, proposed edition was essentially every three years, elders and deacons going through a mandatory re-examination process um, by the congregation. And we just felt like it, two, two things that were wrong with that, and I wrote it, so I'm, I'm critiquing myself here, uh, but two things that were wrong with that was one is, is it would create a culture of elders and deacons being more terms as opposed to them not being term. And that's not the way the Bible talks about them. We shouldn't think of them in terms. But two is it also could just promote unhealthy criticism um, by continually re-examining officers in the life of our church um, in ways that was just would not promote health and trust and um, unity in, in the church. And so we wanted to reword it and change that process, but still have something in here that could allow for the re-examination of officers within our local church. So this section was rewritten in this way. It says, finally, there are instances where members may seek the re-examination of an officer's qualifications for issues which are not related to sin in the officer. Examples of this may include changes in physical or mental health. Okay, so someone's not physically or mentally healthy enough to be serving in the office they're called to. Um, and physically, you might go, well, well, how would that relate? Well, if they're homebound and can't ever come to church because of their physical health, that's they're not going to be able to serve in that office, even if they're mentally fit. All right. So that'd be an example of that. We're not talking about they get a sprained ankle and they have to step down from their office. OK, um, but physical or mental health time commitments, they're just not able to ever attend the meetings, ever to help in a, a substantial way. Um, for example, a deacon, that's a service um, job, but if they're never able to serve the church, um, then based on time commitments, that wouldn't work. Um, or just 
a host of different reasons. Say they take a, a job where they're traveling all the time and they're gone for large swaths of the year. That that would change um, their ability to do that. Or changes to the familial qualification requirements. And this is one that's really painful, but it does happen where, um, say, for example, when an officer is elected, their household is running in good order and their children are um, obedient. They're not quarrelsome. They're, they're following the biblical pattern laid out for an officer keeping control of his own household. And say the kid, their children grow into the teenage years and uh, this rebellion starts to come out that was not present in the discernment when that person was called to office, but now their household is very disorderly. Um, that doesn't necessarily point to a sin in the officer. It may, um, but it may just do to some other circumstances. Now, I would say that officer is always responsible for his own household, and we always take responsibility as the head of our own households. But that might be a circumstance where he's not necessarily sinning, but there is a disqualifying reality in his life and in his family that needs to be addressed. Okay, so those are some different examples of what's being addressed in this paragraph. It says, in these instances, the officer should be addressed directly by the concerned party. If the officer disagrees with the concern, knows this concerned party, this could be one of the other elders, could be one of the other deacons, or it could be a member. All right. Is any any member of the church could be involved in this and says if the officer disagrees with the concern, it should then be brought to the elders for evaluation, excluding the elder in question if applicable. If the concerned member has attempted to address this directly with the officer and then with the elders and the officer remains unwilling to step down, a motion may be made at a quarterly members meeting for the members to reconsider the officer's qualifications. If this motion is made prior to the member first trying to resolve this and the process stated above, it will be ruled out of order according to a general um, principle of conflict resolution based on Matthew 18. Okay, so all of this is just trying to lay out a healthy process um, by which a member or another officer is trying to hold one another accountable to the office's qualifications as laid out in scripture um, for someone who is already serving in that office. Now, these situations are painful. All of this is assuming that there, there is a disagreement on whether or not someone is qualified, where that officer feels they are and does not want to step down, and whether it's a member or one of the other officers feels they really are genuinely disqualified um, to the point where they feel this needs to be brought to the congregation for consideration um, I, I pray that we never have to use this step, but by, by reality and by the nature of indwelling sin in believers and the reality of what happens in the church, we may, and we want to have it spelled out how it ought to happen, but we want, if it happens, it to hand, happen in an orderly way and a way governed by scripture in a way that will be honoring to the Lord. And I think this process would help follow that in ways that the three year re-examination process wouldn't. All right, so I think this is a better section. This is probably the most substantial change of any aspect of the document in this final one. That's why I spent the most time explaining it. Now, um, we're getting to the end of this video, so let me land the plane in committees. Um, nothing really changed, just wording here and there. Again, this was just reworded, um, but not actually changed. Um, here, I just add a qualifier for what a vocational elder is, because some people might have a question about that. What's a vocational elder? It's an elder who is on staff at the church. All right, that's what we mean by vocational elder. Another way to say that would be staff pastor. All right, but vocational elder is the terminology used. But I added a qualifier just in case anyone was unsure what that meant um, to clarify that. No real changes there. Um, and that's it. That's That's the end of the document. Um, no changes of those last few bits. So that being said, these are the proposed change. Really, the vast majority of changes in here are wording changes, commas or not commas, um, and minor, minor phrasing differences with the difference of that process of the three-year examination of officers that being changed. Um, that's really the only major substantive um, change to the document from a procedural standpoint. The rest is just wording things differently um, or phrasing things a little differently um, and, and grammar changes. So this document hasn't changed substantially. I've already kind of put out to you guys what our thinking was on the changing of that three-year process. Most people seem to be 
um, in hearty agreement of that. I haven't heard anyone disagree with that logic. And so, like I said, we're going to put this out there. I'm going to get you a digital and hard copy of this available um, to look over and consider. And as you have concerns, please bring those to us. Oh, I'd much rather hear of concerns before a meeting. Um, we don't want to be arguing over this. And what I will say, and I'll, I'll communicate this on Sunday morning as well, we're not going to do proposed edits um, at the members meeting. What I think it's fair to have people have time of at least a month of the copy in their hands um, to consider before the meeting. Um, that way, what they're voting on, everyone has a point to look through. So we're not going to accept proposed edits at the meeting. We're going to vote on it as is, um, for or against. Um, and I, th I think that's just going to be the most helpful way to go through it. Um, and then if people are not ready to vote on it as is, in other words, they have edits they really think um, should be in there, let us know beforehand because I would rather push back the vote um, than to have people who are just consciously not ready to vote on it, if at all possible. So please communicate. By God's grace, we've done a lot of work on this and we'll be voting on it in June. But if we have to push it back, that's okay as well. We want the membership to really be bought in and covenanted to the things in this document. And we want to take our time in that. So I hope you've been blessed by this whole process. I hope it's not been too boring. And thank you for um, sticking in to this final video. Um, I look forward to hearing um, from you what you, you think regarding these things. May God bless you and keep you, and may his grace and peace be upon you.